I hope. Um, Chris VK3AML in Melbourne, Australia, with the usual Saturday night live streaming exercise. Um, as those of you who've been uh, clicking on the the upload or um, listening to these live streams in past weeks, you'll know that we've re-equipped re this week with a new sound card. The old sound card was working on one of the stereo channels for the better part of 12 months until the remaining channel started to fail as well. But we've replaced that with a sound card that is 12 years more recent and uh, I think we have reason to believe that the audio levels are set up properly. Um, thank you to all the people who uh, dropped emails to me this last week when they noticed that there was no stream. It's <laughs> one of those things, I guess, that when you switch it off, people start to notice. It's good. It means it's finding something of a niche market. Um, when I say niche market, there's nothing commercial about this. I don't make any money from it. It's purely a hobby. Um, I've worked in archives and libraries and broadcasting for most of my professional life and um, knowing where the bodies are buried, which films are which, particularly in documentaries, I thought I might use this for uh, the benefit of this YouTube channel. Trying to dodge copyright wherever pro uh, possible and that's one of the reasons I cover so much history because it's very much easier to find material that's lapsed from copyright if it's pre-war vintage. And for much of that material, it's really interesting material too. Anyway, it's 9.30. I'll go on the air, as usual. Hello, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with the usual Saturday night test transmission for the benefit of amateurs and shortwave listeners from Burwood East, uh, running, I think, about 35 watts at the moment on... 147.475 megahertz NBFM and on YouTube live stream if you care to uh, Google VK3 AML 27 August 2022 you'll certainly well hopefully find our stream that's VK3 Alpha Mike Lima VK3 AML 27 August 2022 which happens to be today's date um, a few things have happened this week that I should draw your attention to. One thing was the arrival of the magazine that I'm holding up in front of the webcam for the live stream, the magazine of the Narrow Band Television Association. And this is a group of rather creative engineering types, hobbyists, some model builders, who are interested in um, television in an audio bandwidth and more to the point, um, quite often mechanical scanning, which this group has got to a, a high state of development, using a lot of ideas that frequently were first mooted before the Second World War. For instance, um, an aperture scanner, like a scanner drum. I'll see if I can hold this flat in front of the webcam. Um, flop, 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 it's a floppy magazine. And you can see the pictures of Jeremy Jago, I think, uh, underneath my hand there, um, using an aperture scanning drum, a um, mechanical scanner, with uh, the apertures punched in manila paper with modulated leads behind, produces a picture of reasonable definition, a recognisable head and shoulders picture of whoever. Um, but this is a magazine that's been running since the mid-1970s. It's now at volume 45, as you can see there if you're looking at the live stream. And um, I can thoroughly recommend uh, the Narrowband Television Association as um, a, uh, an organisation, particularly if you're an experimenter and particularly interested in video, that's worth joining. Um, refer nbtv, narrowbandtv.org that is www.nbtv.org okay, that covers that 
This week I thought we'd cover the rise and the fall of the radio valve. That is, the rise and fall of thermionics, or in the words of Americans, the rise and fall of the radio tube. And uh, the inventor of the radio tube, if you discount Edison's detection of the Edison effect, the DC rectification within light bulbs that was possible back in the mid-1880s, which Edison detected as the Edison effect, um, the chap who brought about the revolution in radio valve technology was Sir Ambrose Fleming, who you see in this picture, born 1849, and he died in 1945. He was 95 when he died. There are a couple of his diodes, carbon filament and a second electrode, which is either a, a piece of metal or a squiggly wire. And uh, Fleming had a long, illustrious career as an engineer and actually was interviewed in 19... 37, I think, on this occasion. Sir Ambrose Fleming. I esteem it a privilege to be filled on behalf of the Institution of Electrical Engineers, and I believe I may, add, I may add that I think I am one of the oldest of their members. During the past 55 years, it has been my privilege uh, to be closely associated with the introduction into Great Britain of three great inventions, the telephone, the electric incandescent lamp, and wireless telegraphy. Having been scientific advisor to the Edison Company for many years, Fleming was able to use this experience to solve the problem of the coherer. In 1904, he successfully created a two-electrode valve out of an Edison lamp. An important feature of this valve was that it passed a current in one direction only. When inserted together with a galvanometer into a tuned electrical circuit, it could be used as a very sensitive rectifying detector of high frequency wireless currents, radio waves. At the grand age of 95, Sir John Ambrose Fleming died in Sidmouth, Devon. To many students of physics, he will be remembered for his left and right hand rules, which indicated the directions of the field, current and force in electrical machines. To understand how electronic tubes work, let's take a good look at one of them, one that's representative of its species. This is a diode, a typical two-element electronic tube. Let's get inside it. In fundamental operation, it resembles an ordinary single-pole switch, a switch that can connect, for instance, this battery and its motor load. One power lead comes to the anode, the other lead goes to the cathode. When this switch is open, the contacts are insulated from each other by a vacuum, or by some inert gas inserted into an evacuated tube under low pressure. To close this switch electronically, all we need do is heat the cathode, and give the anode a positive potential. Then here's what happens. As electrons are emitted from the surface of the heated cathode, being negatively charged, they fly at tremendous speed to the anode. In this way, a current-carrying path is formed, which closes our electronic switch and permits our motor to operate. You'll notice, by the way, that the direction of electron flow is contrary to the orthodox concept of current flow from plus to minus. Now, at this point, you may ask, if an electronic tube is basically just a form of switch, why is electronics hailed today as the technique of a new engineering era? To answer that question, let's review six of the basic things that we can do with this new kind of switch. In the first place, we can rectify current with it, converting AC to DC. We can do this merely by connecting an electronic tube in series with an AC circuit. As you study this circuit diagram, note that only each positive half wave of AC voltage will now produce a current. When the anode is negative, the electrons are repelled and no current flows. In other words, because only the cathode can emit electrons, we have here what amounts to a one-way street. We can visualize the result of the tube's rectifying action with the aid of these two oscilloscopes. The one on the left shows alternating current coming in.
The one on the right shows pulsating direct current going out. The applications of this basic rectifying principle are many and important. Here's one of them, changing AC to DC on the nation's electrified transportation systems. Here's another, rectification for electroplating operations of all kinds, operations possible only with direct current. Still another example, furnishing DC and steel mills for the driving of variable speed motors, such as the one controlling this giant ladle, or the ones driving steel conveyors with such precise control of speeds that danger of buckling and tearing and consequent mill damage is eliminated. Electronic rectification is also helping to build American air power by making available record-breaking quantities of aluminum for plane construction. From Arkansas mud to American air power involves a complicated conversion of material. Before pure aluminum can be extracted from this bauxite ore, direct current must be applied in a vital reduction process. To obtain that direct current from AC transmission lines, the Ignitron rectifier is used. This Westinghouse electronic development changes vast quantities of AC to DC with higher efficiency than any similar type of conversion equipment. Today, it's the main source of current supply for the nation's great aluminum industry, an industry that has achieved a miraculous expansion to meet the demands of a world at war. Magnesium from seawater is another achievement of industry under the stress of war. Ignitrons used in the extraction process speed up the delivering of incendiary and demolition bombs to the centers of Axis production. Still another example of electronic rectification at work is the precipitron, a device for cleaning air electrostatically. This diagram explains how the precipitron works. The rectifying property of electronic tubes is used to apply a potential of 13,000 volts DC to tungsten wires and 6,500 volts DC to collector plates. As incoming air passes through the field of these wires, each particle of dirt receives a positive electrostatic charge. When the positively charged particle reaches the collector chamber, it's attracted to and deposited on negative plates. In this way, air is cleaned so thoroughly that dirt particles down to a quarter millionth of an inch are removed. This is a vital advantage today, not only in homes and public buildings, but in industrial plants of all kinds. For instance, in plants manufacturing delicate instruments where air cleanliness is necessary for precision work in workrooms where optical systems are assembled for a host of military purposes, in inspection rooms where minute parts must be closely examined under high magnification. Air cleanliness is vital too in film developing rooms like this one. To understand how electronic air cleaning helps here, let's go aloft in a reconnaissance plane. Click. 5,000 feet above the earth, a camera shutter opens and closes. Scores of square miles of enemy territory have been squeezed down into an image on a photographic plate. An image measured in inches instead of miles. On this photograph, a city might be covered by a tip of a finger. A speck of dust could hide a Nazi airdrome. The rectifying tubes of the precipitron help make sure that dust doesn't sabotage military photography. Well, so much for the diode. Uh, there's only so much you can do with the diode. It's just purely a, a rectifying agent. But at the time that uh, Fleming introduced it in 1904, it was uh, a more sensitive detector than either the coherer or the magnetic detector, which is attributed originally to Lord Rutherford of New Zealand. But along came 1906, and uh, Lee DeForest, a rather offbeat engineer with more than a healthy ego, tried putting a grid in between the cathode and the plate and found himself for the first time with a fully electronic amplifying system. He didn't think that it worked with electrons. He thought that it worked by um, moderating a stream of ionised gas 
because in those days, 1906, it was very difficult to get a high vacuum. But this was really the start of the electronics industry. I'll just bring up some film of Dr. Lee de Forest in his old age, and later on we'll see him in his younger period. Um, this is Lee de Forest working in his laboratory. The Mickey Mouse ears device on the left there is a movie camera. And after his invention of the triode, a lot of his work was done on devising the first viable method of recording talking pictures in the early 1920s. And we'll see some of those a bit later on. Uh, Lee de Forest uh, originally was impressed by radio's blatant commercialism and appalled by its listening fare is 74 year old Dr. Lee de Forest, one of radio's inventors. To the National Association of Broadcasters, New York City. Gentlemen, what have you done to my child, the radio broadcast? He was conceived as a potent instrumentality for culture, fine music, the uplifting of America's mass intelligence. Lee DeForest's child. You have debased this child, dressed him in rags of ragtime, tatters of jive and boogie-woogie. Here in my hand is the first radio tube, the miracle seed from which sprang the entire mighty structure of radio and television. Sonar, radar, talking pictures, guided missiles, automation, the electric brain computer and long distance telephone communication. This tube was the creation of one great man who at this moment is seated on our stage. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the television audience, I'm happy to introduce one of the greatest inventors who ever lived Dr. Lee DeForest. You sit down, Dr. DeForest. And take a look at this television screen right here before you. We're going to take you now to New York City, and from there, a friend will speak to you, a man who, in his own garage in Montclair, New Jersey, perfected the cathode ray tube, which did so much to give us this miracle of television. Here is the chairman of the board of Dumont Television, Dr. Alan B. Dumont. Hello, Dr. DeForest. I went to work for you as a young engineer in 1928. Together, you and I built the first television transmitter for simulcasting sight and sound. What inspiration you gave me, teaching me to search on and on that the answer could be found. You are a giant figure in our century. Your invention of the audience tube opened the doors to the fabulous future world of radio, television, radar, and a hundred other miracles. Had it not been for you, we could not see or speak to you, as I am now doing across the continent. I congratulate you. <laughs> At 25, you win your PhD degree. You've read everything about Marconi and his first device for wireless telegraphy. You're so certain you can do better, can make wireless a practical reality, that twice you quit jobs and live on $5 a week donated by friends to spend your time in endless experiments. That's right. With your clothes in tatters, <coughs> shoes run down, and last meal ticket punched out, you stand one night in the rain on top of the Lakota Hotel in Chicago. And from how far away did you receive a signal through your new wireless detector? The signal's from Armour Institute, about three, three miles. Years of bleak poverty, but blazing excitement pass. Oh. Now you're sending and receiving signals seven miles, and then 20 miles, and then 100 miles. That's right. At the St. Louis World's Fair, Doc and I sent a message 300 miles. A voice you haven't heard since the year 1906. Now, this is over 50 years ago. Here from Palm Harbor, Florida is your wireless buddy, whom you haven't seen in 50 years, Mr. Harry Pop Ather. How are you? Good. Yes, I'm glad to see you again. So I, was. I'm so glad to know you're alive, boy. There were some doubting Thomases uh, among the officials at the St. Louis World's Fair, weren't there, Mr. Ather? Yes, there were, but Doc convinced them, and Doc, they <laughs> gave you the grand prize gold medal. That's right. The highest honor. That's right. Of the fair. And then in that same year, 1904, you thrilled the world again with history's first use of wireless in war. That's yes. right. 
you. And you were one of the men that did it. You were the one that were, the two that went to took the wireless telegraph to Why Hawaii. Yes. In uh, and put it on the the, the yacht. The, the great English war reporter, Lionel James, yes, uh, Lionel uh, James. met uh, you at that time. And what did you persuade him to do with your uh, new wireless sets, Dr. DeForest? Well, we, he happened to be on the ship that we were going back to from uh, Liverpool to New York. Yes. And uh, Fessenden was on that ship, too. And my, my operator, Har Horton, was, was with me. We made a point to be with Lionel James all the time so that Fessenden could not get to him. <laughs> and we told him, we told him the story that what we could do for him in reporting the... Uh, the in the, covering the Russo-Japanese Russo -Japanese war. Russo-Japanese war, where he was going over to do. Well, you made that trip, Mr. Athern, so tell us the way Dr. DeForest Wireless uh, sets made more history. Well, I had a set on board a chartered steamer, and Admiral Togo's fleet was not far away searching for the Russians. We sighted the Russian fleet, and it said that in our messages to shore, the Japanese were able to find the Russians, and then Admiral Togo performed the classic maneuver of crossing the T and sank that Russian fleet. Well, thank you, Mr. Harry uh, Athern of Palm uh, Harbor, wonderful. Florida. What a thrill to have made history's first world news scoop by wireless. That's right. <laughs> The lean gray men of war of the U.S. Navy search the seas by radar, thanks to you, Dr. DeForest. Back as far as these years of 1902 to 1904, the Navy encourages you. Yes, indeed. The Navy was my best friend from the very beginning. I was, I was with Dr. DeForest when he uh, risked his life against yellow fever to set up the first Navy wireless stations in Cuba and Panama. And I was present when Dr. DeForest invented the audience tube, the greatest invention in the era of electronics. This, sir, from Paradise, California, is Mr. B. F. Greaves, whom you haven't seen in 15 years. And from Mineola, Long Island, your associate of many years, Mr. E. N. Pickerel. So glad to see you, Pickerel. Here in 1904, the, uh, come on up, gentlemen, and uh, stand by the doctor. Uh, let's put him in the middle so we can really get him, uh, you know, we don't want to play any favorites here. They <laughs> both are tremendously fond of you, of course. Here in 1904, the Panama Canal is being dug. What risks you and Dr. DeForest take in setting up those first uh, historic wireless stations for the Navy? Both of you men are with Dr. DeForest. The next exciting year, 1906, a year that men in future centuries will tie to the name of Lee DeForest. Why, Mr. Pickerel? Uh, because in that year, uh, Dr. DeForest's great mind conceived the Audion radio tube. And that summer, uh, he was walking the streets, practically penniless. Uh, because of mismanagement uh, by his financial backers. So he uh, rented a small laboratory in the old Parker building on 4th Avenue in New York City. One day, uh, Doc brought in a mysterious box. He connected it up to the wireless circuit and passed the headphones over to Mr. Burchard. Well, what did Mr. Uh, Burchard say to you, Dr. DeForest, uh, when he listened in? He said, my Lord, Doc, what have you got in that box? <laughs> <laughs> he was listening to those signals. In that mysterious box was the first three-element radio tube, the basic invention that was to rock the electrical world and give to mankind the miracles of radio and television. Thank you, Mr. V.F. Greaves of Paradise, See California, and Mr. E.N. Pickerel of Mineola, New York, distinguished in... Uh, your own right, Mr. Pickerel, as the first man to demonstrate radio from a plane in flight way back in 1910. Genius, they say, is 90% hard work. Here in 1906 and 1907, as always, you're working day and night, caring little how you live or eat, your mind aflame with your idea that wireless waves can be made to carry the human voice. You design and build your first crude carbon arc transmitter. 
And on a never-to-be-forgotten day of October 1907, you ask a young singer to come to your tiny laboratory. In great excitement, you show her a voice pickup phone, and you say, please try to sing through that. From New York City, here is Madame Eugenia Farrar. You made the first broadcast in history, Mrs. Farrar, and who was the first radio announcer in history? Dr. DeForest. <laughs> what? He asked me to sing. And Mr. Edwards. In announcing you to sing? Yes. He was the first announcer, that's right. He was, wasn't he? <laughs> and then a little while after that, he played the uh, records. Yes. So he also became the first disc jack. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, the first disc jockey. <laughs> Someone heard your voices that great day, and here he is from Belmore, Long Island, former Navy wireless operator, Oliver Wyckoff. <laughs> now, uh, where were you uh, when you heard Madame Farrar's voice coming through your wireless set, Mr. Wyckoff? <clears throat> I was a wireless operator on the Secretary of the Navy's yacht, the USS Dolphin, and we were entering New York Harbor at that time mm -hmm. when I heard the voice over the wireless. I uh, was uh, astonished and surprised, and I brought in the, uh, some of the crew to listen to it. What did you think had happened? Well, I thought somebody had connected up a phonograph record or something to my set and was pulling a fast one on me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you really didn't realize that radio was being born that day. Oh, yes, it, uh, I didn't at that, no. But it was, and thank you, Mr. Oliver Wyckoff and Madam Eugenia Farrar, New York City. You'll see, you'll see Dr. a little later. In 1908, you marry Nora Blatch. And in 1909, to your joy, your first daughter, Harriet, is born. Yeah. In 1910, you make history again from the Metropolitan Opera. What first did you score that year? Uh, broadcast the voice of Caruso. First, 1910, from the roof of the Me Metropolitan Opera House. First broadcast of uh, Grand Opera. In 1912, almost by chance, you hook up two of your audion tubes in series and discover that your tube is also an amplifier, the magic device which makes possible today all long distance and overseas telephones, as well as every other instrument which amplifies sound. And also an oscillator. An oscillator? An oscillator too. that which became the parent of all today oscillator tubes. Yes. Transmitter sir. station. 1913 to 1923, you give your immense talents to a new dream of yours, the talking movie. Now, that story deserves a half hour in itself. You tried to get every big producer in Hollywood to listen to you, didn't you, sir? <laughs> but they turned you down. Yet you go on, on your own, and are the first to make and distribute sound on film movies in 1923, years before Hollywood accepted it, and because of your pioneering, revolutionized the movies. Dr. Lee DeForest, the inventor of the triad valve, and that, needless to say, was from This Is Your Life with Ralph Edwards, uh, an episode of it from 1956, the year that Australia got uh, television, or at least we did in Sydney and Melbourne. This is VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, with the regular Saturday night test transmission. Well, having seen the inventor of the triode valve, let's see a little of what the triode valve can do. And first of all, I'd like to introduce you to one of the great announcers of the 1930s, who originally came to fame as the documentarist who went to the Middle East during the First World War and filmed, uh, took a film called With Lawrence in Arabia. Uh, Lowell Thomas was his name. Lowell Thomas, an almost forgotten name now, but in the 1930s you would have seen him like this. This is Lowell Thomas speaking, flashing to you the news of the world, pictured by Fox Movie Tone. And that he was on just about every newsreel. So naturally, when Western Electric came to do a, a documentary on valves, on the triode, they got Lowell Thomas as the announcer. <laughs>
too, Bill. Still holding the fort, I see. How are you, George? I haven't seen you around here in a long time. This is Bill Miller, the chief of our transmitter station. Bill, Mr. Thomas. Glad to know you, Mr. Miller. How do you do, Mr. Thomas? It's quite an event for us to have a broadcast from here. This is a special one on vacuum tubes, Bill. How about showing them some real ones? Oh, sure thing. Step right over here. Take a look in there, Mr. Thomas. That's where your voice current has stepped up before it goes out into the ether, Lowell. It's a whopper, isn't it? They're among the largest tubes made, Mr. Thomas. They handle so much power that they have to be cooled by a circulating water system. Yes, sir. If it weren't for these babies, there wouldn't be any radio. And worse yet, Bill and I'd be out of a job. <laughs> you bet. Yes, and a million others owe their jobs to the vacuum tube, including myself. As a matter of fact, practically everybody has been benefited by it in some way. My broadcast begins with, 25 years ago in New York, Alexander Graham Bell repeated the first words ever transmitted by telephone. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. But this time, the inventor's assistant laughed. I can't make it under a week, Dr. Bell. I'm in San Francisco. It was the first transcontinental telephone conversation. This exchange of greeting marked the opening of transcontinental telephony. The same year saw speech transmitted across the Atlantic by the first radio telephone. Yet both of these miracles of communication developed from a single discovery, the vacuum tube. A discovery which sprung from a chance observation in this workshop of a great inventor at Menlo Park, New Jersey. The story begins in 1883 with trouble. The breaking of the filaments of Thomas A. Edison's incandescent lamp. Observing that the break invariably occurred at the positive end of the filament, Edison reasoned that some unknown negative electrical particles were bombarding this end of the hot wire. Further experiments revealed that the flow of charged particles could be influenced by an extra wire sealed into the bulb of the lamp. Edison recorded this curious phenomenon in his notebook and turned to his many other inventions. It became known as the interesting but useless Edison effect. A generation later, Dr. Lee DeForest added a third element which transformed the Edison effect into a bottle of magic, the first vacuum tube. But it remained for Bell Telephone Laboratory's scientists and engineers to perfect and commercialize the vacuum tube. Notable among this host of researchers for Western Electric and the Bell system were Drs. Jewett, Cole Pitts, Vanderbilt, and the late Dr. Arnold. With their colleagues, they developed the tube into a commercial sensation. And then in a hundred specialized forms, they applied it to the facilities of electrical communication. Thus, from this product of the Bell Laboratories grew four great new industries. Long-distance telephony, radio, the modern phonograph, and the sound motion picture industries. Can you recall the telephone of a generation ago? New York to Denver was the longest call that could be made, and it was uncertain. Then the vacuum tube went into service, and the transcontinental telephone became a reality. Lines spread to every city and town and hamlet in the country. Radio telephones spanned every ocean, connecting the telephone in your home with 38 million of the world's 40 million telephones. All because a vacuum tube can amplify the human voice without distortion. The product of this magic lamp we call a vacuum tube is not light, but electricity. Electrons set free from the atoms of matter that hold them captive. And the world and all it contains are built of atoms. Yet hidden in every single last atom is from one to 92 electrons. This wire, like everything else, is composed of atoms. And if microscopes could magnify 10 million times instead of paltry thousands, one of these atoms probably would appear as a tiny elastic sphere, a sphere formed by negatively charged electrons swarming around a massive nucleus of positive electricity. Some substances, especially metals, do not keep their electrons tightly bound to the individual atoms, but allow them to roam around aimlessly between the atoms in the interior of the substance. Such substances are called electrical conductors, because if a battery is connected to the ends of a wire made of such a substance, the free electrons drift along the wire, 
continuing their aimless motions as they drift. It is this mass movement of electrons that we call an electric current. Whenever the aimless motion of an electron carries it past the surface of the metal into the space outside, it is immediately pulled back by the electric attractions between the electron and the atom community it has left. To become useful in a vacuum tube, however, these electrons must be separated from their atom communities and allowed to move alone. This we do by heating the wire with an electric current. The atoms and electrons become increasingly agitated until some of the electrons rush at the surfaces of the wire at high speed, speed so high they could flash from New York to Detroit in one second. At these speeds, electrons are able to break through the electric forces which try to restrain them. They escape to move about in space outside the wire. Now, if we set up a nearby target of positive electricity, the electrons which escape from the surface of the wire are pulled directly to the plate. Actually, however, the space between the wire and plate is jam-packed with gyrating air atoms, literally billions of them. And to reach the plate, the electrons would have to bump their way through them like midgets in a subway crowd. And many of the electrons would be pulled into strange atoms on the way. This problem is solved by enclosing the wire and plate in a glass bulb. Then a vacuum is created by pumping out every possible air atom. And right here is where we get the name vacuum tube. Now the negative electrons shoot straight at the positive plate without interference. This pulling of electrons from atoms isn't done for amusement. On the contrary, it's an important economic problem. Research to date has increased many fold the number of electrons that can be freed for a cent. And each year, this little item alone saves us about $12 million on power bills to run our radio sets. Here is how it was done. Research revealed that some atoms give up their electrons more willingly than others. So the engineers devised coatings for vacuum tube filaments. These coatings produce surfaces which permit electrons to escape at comparatively low temperatures. In this way, the power required to heat the filament is substantially reduced. Now, with but a trickle of current, the improved filament barely glows. Yet away from each square inch of its hot surface flow more than 10 trillion electrons a second. The positive plate, the tube's second element, is completed by adding an outgoing wire. Control, however, is lacking. Needed is a traffic cop on the electronic highway. And this is the job of the vacuum tube's third element, or electrode, the grid. And with its introduction begins the real utility of the tube. Made negative to repel the negative electrons flowing from the filament, each increase or decrease of voltage applied to it lets few or many electrons pass to the plate. Or should you prefer an Arabian Nights technique, these aroused monkeys throwing pebbles at a target through a shutter ably portray what goes on in a vacuum tube. Simple, isn't it? Yet it's the essence of one of the world's most important discoveries. The ability of the electronic vacuum tube to amplify or control any sort of electrical wave motion puts a hundred million new tubes to work each year. Yet if we know how they are used in telephony, we can understand their function in all speech transmission apparatus. To reproduce the human voice across the United States without vacuum tubes and telephone lines would require about 150,000 hog callers spaced within earshot. The time entailed, more than five hours. The telephone does it better in a twelfth of a second. And instead of hog callers, it uses repeater stations, 40 or more dotting the speech highway, for instance, between New York and San Francisco. Inside are banks of vacuum tube amplifiers, repeater tubes, the telephone engineers call them. Tubes in each repeater station function on every long distance call, amplifying the voice each way. Here's how it's done. Vibrating under the impact of sound waves, the transmitter diaphragm starts a pulsating movement of electrons along the wire. But as the energy of the electrons is gradually used up in forcing those ahead into light pulsations, the voice current becomes weaker by the mile. Entering the grid in feeble waves, the voice current is nevertheless ample to mold the electrons flowing from the filament into a similar wave pattern. 
re-energized without distortion, the voice current now speeds from the plate and tube, arriving at the receiver with just the right strength to reproduce the original sound waves. How much is your voice amplified by these repeater stations between New York and San Francisco? You say it, I can't. The figure is 10 with 99 zeros after it. Yet the voice sounds are neither louder nor softer when they arrive than they were when they started. For these magic lamps amplify enough to exactly offset the energy lost on the way. Regardless of the merit of an invention or discovery, it achieves greatness only when it contributes to the well-being of many people. This is the role of Western Electric and like organizations, the mission of making such inventions as the vacuum tube available to all of us. Theirs is the exacting business of building into each product the qualities of long life, dependability, and operating efficiency. Here in the Western Electric vacuum tube plant, each operator is a skilled craftsman, a trained specialist in his or her particular task. This painstaking care in manufacture has earned for the telephone repeater and its sister tubes the unique distinction of being custom made. Typical is the making of repeater tubes, the vacuum tubes used in long distance telephony. They begin their long life in this automatic hot cut flare machine. Long lengths of glass tubing are cut into pieces and carefully flared to size at each end, each piece destined for use in the glass foundation of a tube. The prepared flares are here drawn out at one end to receive the spaced lead-in wires. The flares, prepared and formed, are now put on metal supports in which the lead-in wires have been inserted. Then this stem-making machine whirls the glass and metal combination through the carefully spaced and sized jets of burning gas and through automatic pressing jaws. Into an annealer, it last delivers a complete glass foundation or stem. A stem gas tight, free from strains, with lead-in wires exactly sized and spaced for the mounting of tube electrodes. The uniformity of Western electric tubes is largely due to the precise work of this automatic grid winding machine. It holds two heavy wires which serve as grid supports, notches them to secure the small grid windings, winds the finer wire in place, then hammers the notches over the windings. Spacings between windings are uniform to a few millionths of an inch and the operation is concluded without stretching or deforming any of the wires. From rolls of carbon-coated nickel sheet, this carefully guarded punch press turns out halves of plate sections. The plate halves are next fastened together by a sort of metal stitching called staking. The resulting electrode, the plate which catches the electrons in the completed tube, is accurate in its dimensions to a few thousandths of an inch. The vital third element of the vacuum tube, the filament, is begun in annealing and coating machines. Metal ribbon, the core material, is drawn without stretching through heated tunnels and over pulleys and guides until the chemical coating is completely applied. Running with perfect synchronization, this machine cleans the filament ribbons in the heated tube on top and returns them through three chemical coating baths. Throughout this entire process, the chemical composition of the coating and the dimensions of the coated filament are controlled to the closest limits. The elements of the tube are its glass foundation, its filament, grid and plate, together with some supporting pieces. And these are all brought together in the assembly position. On accurately machined jigs, they are fitted into each other and securely fastened in place by electric welding. Adjusted for each weld, the welding machine delivers precisely the amount of electrical energy required to make the metals flow together to obtain a secure joint. Completed, the tube structure is accurate within microscopic limits in all its spacings. None of the parts are distorted in the least as a result of the assembly, and yet the finished product is sufficiently rugged to withstand ordinary handling both during subsequent manufacture and in shipment and use. At this point, 
the complete assembly is sealed into a glass bulb. The assembly is held in the revolving head of a gas-fired machine. The bulb is put over it, and then the bottom of the bulb is cut away by melting at a point where bulb and stem can be securely fused together. The completed seal-in, as it is called, is gas-tight and free from strains or leaks or other defects. On this automatic exhaust machine, the tube becomes a vacuum tube, for all gases are drawn from it. With vacuum pumps operating full blast, the tube is swept into a tunnel where it is heated electrically to a degree just short of melting the glass. This drives all impurities out of the glass envelope and the tube elements and down into the pumps. At this point, the base is fitted over the lead-in wires. These are clipped and bent into position. And the tube is sent through a gas-fired tunnel to fasten the base to the glass by high temperature cementing. From the basing machine, the tube goes to the soldering position. Here the leads are soldered to the sides of the metal projections that make the contacts between the tube elements and the telephone circuit in which it is to be used. Each based and soldered tube now goes into an aging socket and receives full load operating voltages for eight to 16 hours. And at the end of this stabilizing treatment, it is tested for uniformity, stability, and serviceability. And finally, the repeater tube is carefully cleaned. It is now ready for use. But even here, insistence on manufacturing perfection is manifested in the sample tubes picked at random from the production line for special tests and life runs. And in these files are kept the records of each of these sample tubes, records which show that these tubes will operate over 50,000 hours and still perform at top efficiency. Here are the tubes which give voice to radio and talking pictures. Tubes that enable the public address system to speak to thousands and the telephone user to talk across continents. And built into all of them are the endurance and high performance of the telephone repeaters, from those no larger than a peanut to this 100 kilowatt job and giant 250 kilowatt vacuum tubes, the biggest broadcasting tubes in the world. Yes, tube making in this plant is more than a manufacturing process, it's an art. And the men and women you have seen are artisans, artisans who translate the achievements of research into the qualities inherent in all Western electric vacuum tube. A distant earthquake or bringing an elevator level with the floor, wherever you find the vacuum tube working its magic, it will be promoting your security and comfort and convenience. <coughs> Calling flight 14. Okay, 14. Weather at terminal, ceiling unlimited. Thin scattered clouds at 500 feet. Visibility 5 miles. Wind northeast, 17 miles. There is only one course, and that course begins with a decision that the rights of man, liberty, and justice are in the United States to stay. Hello, Mother. I'm phoning from the ship. We're a thousand miles at sea. Okay, headquarters. Car 60 on the way to Lee Avenue call. Get me a radio compass bearing on that SOS. Hurry it up. All of these things and more are happening every day, happening because of a single product of industrial research. And while it was girdling the earth with speech, the vacuum tube added billions to our national income, raised our standard of living, produced numberless new conveniences. From it developed great and small new industries, the network of long distance telephony, radio broadcasting, high fidelity recorded music, talking motion pictures. This magic lamp has created a million jobs in every city and town and village in the country. Jobs in service and manufacture. Jobs in entertainment and education. 
It has built a thousand factories, opened 10,000 stores and shops, created vast demands for the raw materials of farms and mines and forests. All these things and more happened because of a single product of individual enterprise and the American way of life. And so long as they endure, there will be no end to the miracles of this modern Aladdin's land, the vacuum tube. And now a rare look at the start of one of the industries that was afforded a start by the Aladdin's lamp of the triode valve. Los Angeles, California. A look in where you tune in at KHJ. Views of the popular broadcasting station whose entertainments on the air cheer thousands nightly. This is 1924. And the Pathé Newsreel. And here's their antenna up on top of the Los Angeles Times building. Naturally, a a radio station near Hollywood was one of the first to be filmed. And there you see the T antenna with the top capacity hat on the uh, transmitting masts of KHJ. Have a close look. Vertical part is radiating. The top hat is simply capacity loading. Uh, Many 160 metre people will know how this works. In the control room, the apparatus is carefully regulated before the performance starts, and we see a control room of 1924. Notice the Western Electric horn loudspeaker on the left, double button carbon mic looking rather like a telephone dial at the bottom, and that's the mixer down at the bottom on the table. And the mixing man is listening through tin can headphones. The output tubes from KHJ's transmitter. This could have produced about, uh, I think, about 500 watts, but certainly not more than that. These are very early triodes. Meet the voice of KHJ. Uncle John Daggett spends most of his time on the air, and he had his trademark canary in the studio beside him, tweeting away while he was announcing. First number on the program, the Lubovsky Trio soaring away at a cello and a violin and bashing away at a piano while a chap holds a double-button Western Electric microphone at the back. Double-button carbon. Dr Mars F. Baumgart, noted astronomer of Clark Observatory, gives a few tips on the stars. Well, here I am. I'm wearing my celluloid collar and I get astronomer's neck by looking up too much. It cuts my neck off, this damn celluloid collar. He must be saying something like that. Tis known as the children's hour when KHJ kiddies capture Uncle John Daggett. There's Uncle John with the kiddies who for some strange reason on radar, uh, radio were forced to wear costume a costume that nobody saw except on the Pathé newsreel. Interestingly, Daggett uh, married one of the older children in 1926, an 18-year-old. A peek at Queen Titania and the Sandman of Fairyland radio fame. And these must have been the chief announcers of the children's session. Notice the canary on the left named Kindness. One of the children performers. Must have been a bit of a thrill getting into the movies. Talking into a transmitter is no trouble at all to Richard Hedrick, even though he's seven years old. Look at that double-button carbon mic. What one wouldn't give for one in that condition. Before signing off, Uncle John says everybody wants to see Sunny Jane Hughes. And here she is with her Colleen Moore haircut. Very confident little kid, considering she's being seen on film. And uh, Uncle John Daggett also appeared in an Our Gang comedy in the following year, 1925, a film called Mary, Queen of Tots. The famous Uncle John speaks to tens of thousands, and there he is again with the canary in the background. This is Radio KHJ, The Times, Los Angeles, California. 
and the Our Gang kids listening in. Not the way you use a horn loudspeaker, by the way. Presenting a playlet entitled Take Off That Hat. And here we go. Here are the actors. Standing in front of the microphone. Take off that hat. Hey! Out it goes on the transmitter. And knocks over a couple of our gang kids. Mickey Daniels, I think, is one. They're wondering where the voices come come from. Take off that hat. So they do what they're told. Of course, broadcasting was fairly new in 1925, so the kids might not have known where the sound was coming from. Spookers, not speakers. Hey! And they stop in their tracks. The novelty of radio. And interrupting them comes the man of the house. Seeing that they're all behaving themselves. The tall one's Mickey Daniels. The leader of the R gang in the mid-twenties. And here is Mary Cornman later to go on to a considerable film career as a young girl in the 30s. It's one of her first films. And back on live stream. This is VK3, Alpha Mike Lima with the regular Saturday night test transmission. Well, I mentioned earlier that Dr Lee DeForest uh, used the triode valve in the early 20s in an attempt to popularise talking pictures and we'll see a few of those now uh, made in the very early 1920s long before the jazz singer but one of the first tests of optical sound film that is recording sound on the film itself by modulating a light source through a slit onto the continuously moving film at the sprocket in the camera was a professor J.T. Ticosina he was uh, Pole and he worked at the University of Illinois, as you'll see. These are Professor Tikasina's tests, demonstration of the first experimental talking films produced in 1921-22 at the University of Illinois by Professor J.T. Tikasina. Apparatus for photographing speech and pictures simultaneously on a film. The light of a mercury lamp is modulated in accordance with the vibrations of speech or music. Sound records are obtained by photographing variations of the amount of flickering light falling upon the film. And there is the apparatus, the actual camera. You can see the mercury bulb on the left of the film magazine and the apparatus at the top of the camera for keeping the film at a constant speed while the recording light was going. Apparatus for reproducing the speech and music by means of a photoelectric cell and for projecting pictures upon the screen at the same time. And there's the projector with all the audio gear up the top. Remember, this is 1921. It's a long time back. Amplifiers were in there. Uh, infancy and so were photoelectric cells. The photoelectric cell was developed by Professor Jacob Kunz which converts variations of light intensity into variations of electric current and there it is in, in progressive stages of shielding. The tube at the top, the main shield and support below, below again the shield and the film gate below that. The next picture is Professor E.B. Payne reading aloud and showing how a photograph of his speech appears to the eye. The audio is quite poor.
The first experiment was made in October 1921 and was a recording of the following words spoken by Professor J.T. Tikasina. This is an experiment in the reproduction of sound. One, two, three, four. That was a hundred years ago. Mrs. Tikasina ringing a bell while saying, I will ring. Did you hear the bell ringing? Mr. Lader of the School of Music playing the violin, 1921. But Lee De Forest could do a lot better. He actually hired an amplifier from Western Electric, and this is his voice the test. The purpose of this test is to demonstrate that this method and apparatus is entirely operating. This record is made with a light source consisting of a glass tube filled with nitrogen gas using as electrodes two small tungsten balls separated by one half millimeter and supplied with high frequency alternating current. That was Lee DeForest in 1922. Uh, we're taking this at about uh, 80 feet a minute. The man you see at the bottom of the screen is a key player in the start of optical sound on film. His name is Theodore W. Case. During the First World War, he developed a photo detector called a, a thallium ox oxysulfide or thalified cell, which was capable of uh, producing photo resist with a high speed response so it could reproduce sound. And he worked with Dr. Lee de Forest on the development of uh, cathode glow tubes for recording to make sound recordings on film. This is one of his earliest tests, I think the start of 1924. Uh, I'll read a little from the Lincoln speech. It is for us the living, rather to be dedicated... <coughs> it is for us the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Now, uh, here is a test word that I want to try. Cheese uh, crisps. Cheese Crisp. All right, E.I., uh, you can shut the thing off now. Yeah, shut it off. E.I., will you please shut the camera off? Now, a change of pace. You probably won't have heard of Axel Peterson and Arnold Polson who were engineers working in Denmark on a similar system to De Forest's recording variable density soundtrack, optical soundtracks on film. 
you probably will have heard of the company that was started by Axel Peterson and Arnold Polson, which still exists to this day. It's the famous moving coil pickup company Autofon, O-R-T-O-F-O-N. And at the start of the existence of the company, they were trying to popularise sound films. This, from 1923, is one of the first tests they ever made showing the effect of recording location sound and then there's a demonstration optical sound film with a child cellist named Ruth Dietzmann, obviously a, a child prodigy on the cello. So this is a sound test made in Denmark in 1923. And here are Axel Peterson and Arnold Poulsen with their equipment, which produced these results. I gather this was a, an alarm for the arrival of a train. And now Ruth Dietzmann playing her cello, 1923. <laughs> Sound films from 100 years ago. Getting back to Dr. Lee De Forest, here he is with his so-called phono film camera. The glow tube that recorded the sound was actually above the camera. Later practice was to have it below. So this placed the soundtrack before the picture on the film, not after it, as was later practice with case movie tone. But De Forest used this camera to film all sorts of people. One of the first in 1923 was the first time Eddie Cantor, the famous comedian, was filmed. And he's in sound, as you'll hear. Eddie Cantor, the star of the Ziegfeld Follies of 1922. Hello? Oh no, 
No, lady. No, you're wrong. I'm not Tommy Meehan. Funny how everybody takes me for Tommy Meehan. No, Tommy hasn't got that certain, uh, you know, that I have. But uh, it's a funny thing. For a man that's good-looking as I am, I get the homeliest girl. I just canceled the girl of mine, yes. Homely? Oh, you've heard about people's faces being wrinkled? Hus was a court eater. And, and she had a very, very nice family. Of course, they had a lot of hard luck. Yes, her, her poor father, uh, he died of throat trouble. They hung him. And her brother, lovely chap, but he's gone, poor fella. With good behavior, he ought to be out in uh, 1927 or 8. You know, he used to work in a bank. But no matter how much the boss likes you, you can't work in a bank and bring home samples. Oh, no. And she was a nice girl. I didn't mind her being homely, but she was so dumb, terribly dumb. Well, she was so dumb, they had to burn down the schoolhouse to get her out of the second grade. Can't beat that. Well, enough about her. I think I'll recite. That's it. I feel poetical. There was a man who loved the bees. He was their earnest friend. He used to sit upon their hives, but they stung him in the end. <laughs> Thank you. I knew you'd like it. Now I think I'll sing. It's the safest thing for me to do. Mr. Olson, would you play something for Eddie? Do that, will you? And moving on, um, that's Dr. Leader Forrest in the middle there with Theodore Case on the left. Jointly, they made the first sound newsreel by taking their camera to Washington to film a speech by President Coolidge on the White House grounds. And this is Silent Cal. Country needs every ounce of its energy to restore itself. The costs of government are all assessed upon the people. This means that the farmer is doomed to provide a certain amount of money out of the sale of his produce no matter how low the price to pay his taxes, the manufacturer, the professional man, the clerk must do the same from their income. The wage earner, often at a higher rate when compared with his earning, makes his contribution, perhaps not directly, but indirectly in the advanced cost of everything he buys. The expenses of the government reach everybody. One of the greatest favors that can be bestowed upon the American people is economy in government. The laissez-faire principle. Silent Cal Coolidge. One of his op opponents for the 1924 elections was Senator, Senator Robert La Follette. And he was filmed in Washington with a rather more lively speech. If we would preserve the spirit as well as the form of our free institutions, the patriotic citizenship of the country must take its stand and demand of wealth that it shall conduct its business lawfully, that it shall no longer furnish the most flagrant examples of persistent violation of statutes while invoking the protection of the court. And that was the first series of sound newsreels made by DeForest in August 1924. DeForest saw a great f future for sound films, but unfortunately very few others in the film industry did. But he did record a lot of classic acts, and he also made the first foreign language sound film. In Spanish, the performer was Conchita Piquet. Silarica! Hola mañica, hola mañu, ¿cómo está? Yo bien y tú, pues ya lo ves, he hecho un zángano. Y tu madre, en la cocina, y tu padre, trabajando, y tu hermanico, durmiendo, y la burra, en el establo. Me alegro que la familia se haya buena. Gracias mañu. Y entonces suena alegres las bandurrias y guitarros. Y se oyen esas coplitas llenas de gracia y encanto. Conchita Piquet. And now, 
naturally, being Dr. Lee DeForest, a radio sketch was one of the first films that he shot with sound, featuring uh, Phil Baker, the accordion-playing comedian. B-U-N-K-S-A-P announcing. You have just heard the Sears Roebuck Symphony Orchestra play a brand new selection entitled Many a Happy Home Has Been Broken Up by an Idle Rumor. Tonight we are broadcasting directly from the gold room of the automat. The Sears Roebuck Symphony Orchestra of 75 selected musicians Play here every afternoon at 2 a.m. by courtesy of the Fulton Fish Market. We'll be delighted to receive any telegrams from our listeners out telling us how much they like our program. Any telegrams except those send collect. We're no fools. Telegram for RUA staff. That's me. You look it. Oh, here. 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 Here what I have to say. Get out. We have received 50 or 60 telegrams. The first one reads as follows. My dear Mr. Sapp, we are listening in and want you to know that we are with you to the last man. Daughters of the American Revolution. I want to thank the daughters for their cute little telegram. The next number on the program, I take great pleasure in introducing Professor Pitsy Cato, a French violinist from the other side. The other side of Jersey City. Mr. Pitsy Carter. Hollywood Francais? Chevalier Francais. So is your old man. You have music? Yes, no? Ah, Mr. Pitsy Carter's first selection will be the quartet from A.B.'s Irish Road. He is a little nervous, this being his first appearance in front of the microphone, and he's breaking in a new suit for the occasion. He paid $90 for the suit. Got nine pair of pants. I'm sure my listeners in enjoyed uh, that uh, selection by Professor Pizzicato. I should have said they were carried away by it. Professor Pizzicato is now being carried to the hospital. Are you two boys here again? Oh, uh, here. 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 Yeah, here comes the bride. Get out. Oh, this is a news item, maybe of interest. The landlords of this city that have lowered their rents this year will hold a meeting tomorrow at the railroad station in the third telephone booth. 
It is now time for the bedtime stories. I take great pleasure in introducing Dewdrop the Fairy, who will tell the kiddies a cute little bedtime story. Come in, Dewdrop. Come in. How do you do? How do you do? How are you? I am fine, but you're not looking so well. I'm not feeling so well. I had a lot of x-rays taken this morning. If they come out all right, I'll give you one. I will leave uh, the kiddies to the mercy of Dewdrop's affairs. My darling little children, I will now tell you a bedtime story. Once upon a time, there was a little boy who had a grandpapa. And this grandpapa had a big, long beard. Don't say I didn't warn you, folks. This is VK3AML with a test transmission. Currently, if you uh, dial in on our Google, uh, on your Google, VK3AML 27 August 2022, you will see... Um, some experimental sound films made in the early 1920s, this is in 1924, um, featuring uh, Sid Silvers and um, Phil Baker, the accordion-playing comedian, in a radio sketch made by Dr. Lee DeForest himself at his New York studio. Uh, this is one of the earliest sound films and probably the earliest representation on a sound film of a radio studio. You'll notice that they were using a wind-up gramophone to play records and a double-button carbon mic that, uh, if you're watching, you can actually see on the screen. Back to Sid Silvers. One day, the little boy said, Grandpapa, tell me, when you go to bed, do you slumber with your beard on top of the covers? Or do you put your beard under the covers? And the grandpa was very much annoyed when he says, Go away, don't bother me. The next day, the little boy asked again. He said, Grandpa, Grandpa, don't hold out on me. Tell me, when you go to bed, do you slumber with your beard on top of the cover? Or do you put your beard under the cover? And the grandpa again said, go away, don't bother me. But that night, the grandpa went up to his room to go to bed. He could not slumber. So, first, he put his beard on top of the cover. Now, he could not slumber. He put his beard under the cover. <laughs> he could not slumber. He tried that many times, and still he could not slumber. He got very much excited. He got all overheated and perspiring. When he got up and drank a glass of water, when he died of heart failure. And my dear little children, would you believe that to this day, that little boy not know whether his grandpapa slumber mid the beard on top of the cover or mid the beard under the cover. Good night. And that's called the punchline failing. This is VK3 AML and you've been watching a deforest phono film from 1924. <laughs> And now, material we weren't supposed to see, outtakes and camera sound tests made by Movie Tone and Theodore Case in the late 1920s, 1927-28, by courtesy of the University of South Carolina. The first Movie Tone sound newsreel van, number eight, with a crew of Ferrar and Fredericks, was sent from New York to San Francisco, and this is the departure of the first newsreel van from New York with sound. Boys, you have a very 
important assignment, coast to coast. I have here a letter from Mr. Fox to Mr. Sheehan, which I hope that you will be able to hand Mr. Sheehan in about 10 days. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Movie tone man George Cruzen makes a sound test comparing Vitaphone sound on disc with movie tone sound on film. Uh, friends, you just uh, listened to Conrad Nagel in his announcement on Vitaphone. We have shown you a Vitaphone subject, and now in our humble way, we're going to attempt to give you a demonstration. Cut. Uh, this is a sound test uh, by field outfit number 14. George uh, Cruzen speaking. Very quiet now. You've had train interference during this period up until this moment. You're getting the best test at this moment, I think. Niagara Falls, 1927. The sound man tests his film recorder on the running board of his van. Uh, this is the test record we're making here in Niagara Falls. Right in front of the uh, of a church on a back street here. And the test, the idea of the test is to find out whether or not the amplifier is okay or not. There's some doubt about the uh, sensitivity of the thing. We made a test down here on the ripples above the bridge going over to the American Falls <coughs> the, this morning. And uh, Louis Wall's amplifier seemed to be a whole lot uh, lower in volume or in uh, quality than what this was. Or there's a high pitch to it, which it hasn't got. And the idea is now that we're going to run this test off, and chances are before we get back home, we'll have word whether it's good or not. All right, Al. Just a test being made uh, on the amplifier and, and camera number 645 on the back street here in Niagara Falls. There's a train, an engine, uh, I imagine about four or five blocks away. You can just slightly hear the thing. Uh, the amplification on this here is about 17, and the level of... Uh, 14, I guess it is, 12 or 14. And uh, the idea is to take and see if this amplifier is as sensitive and as good in the quality as what the one on number six truck is. There's some doubt about that in regards to this morning and the ripples above the uh, American Falls, right above the bridge. Yeah, okay, well, his, well, the quality on this was very good. His was all right also. And uh, the thing is, there's a train down there, there's an awful lot of noise, and there's an automobile going to pass the microphone right about now. The film's about out. The film about out, Al? We got, uh, still got a little bit more. The train uh, just pulled out of the station. That's the Niagara Falls station. And it made quite a lot of noise. There's another Ford coming up the street now. It sounds though he is. He's turning around somewhere. Everything is quiet now. The amplifier... Uh, I'm, gonna I'm not going to talk anymore now. I leave the amplifier go to... And now a camera test with some ham acting by one of the crew and a slightly blue story recorded in 1927. <clears throat> you know, I put that traveling man in the back seat today. That fellow here's been making all these wise cracks to me. I says to him, <clears throat> how you getting along? Oh, he says, all right. He says, how are you getting along? Oh, I says, I'm getting along all right. He says, I expect you're a fellow lead a pretty fast life, don't you? I says, yes, I've been on three excursions so far this year. Then riding around all over town on the bicycle without using the handlebars. That settled him. See, I got another one, too. I want you to get this one. <clears throat> you know, that uh, girl I've been going with, well, of course, that traveling man, you know, he was here last year, and he knew that I'd been going with him. He says to me, he says, what became that sweet potato you were going with last year? Uh, you mean that girl's working there at the restaurant? He says, yes. Oh, I said, she got a little expensive, so I just put her back in circulation. <laughs> that held him. A test film from 1927. Electronic tone generators were expensive in 1927, so how do you test audio levels and frequency response? Yeah, that'll knock them dead in New York, you know. That'll knock me down. 
Who needs an audio oscillator? In the New York studio, even in 1927, they had electronic tone generators. A test being made on a small stage after the uh, after the thing after the hairdressing party this afternoon, and we've given you a test of uh, 64 cycles to 8192. All right, Frank. My dear friends, wait a minute, Jim. Keep on talking. You have just seen a most remarkable example of the latest Louder. invention Louder. so far as movie cameras are concerned. And now 1928, Edward Prince of Wales is filmed with, a sound, with sound for the first time in very dark overcast conditions. Movie Tone sound man recorded his apologies for the results. I think I can realise the skill that your technical advisors and engineers have displayed in overcoming the obstacles they surely encountered. Mr. Spanova. The band uh, is going to play in just a few minutes, and I want to tell you about the weather conditions over here. It's been a dark, damp day all day long, and we've had our microphone out here, and the chances are that it may have broke down a little bit. In my earphones, it sounded as if uh, there was a regular gale going, and to tell you the truth, there really was. I want you to take this into consideration when judging this record. Charlie's going to shut off now. We've done the best we can on this proposition, and if it isn't good enough, we'll take another record of the Prince of Wales at some future date. Thank you. The 30th of August 1927, in one of Movie Tone's first sound tests, the Fox Company's Mr. Richardson recites his own poem called The Projectionist. This is one of the earliest surviving test reels of Movie Tone, Fox Movie Tone sound. And in four minutes, we'll open for callback on two metres. This is uh, a demonstration of some of the earliest attempts at recording optical sound on film by Dr. Lee de Forest and later on this particular test, Theodore W. Case. The 30th of August, 1927. Well, boys, here we are up in Lake Placid having a dickens of time for ourselves, and here I am up on the screen about three feet wide and putting there as thick as the substance of a good, strong dream. And I'm being thrown out here by a fellow back there in the projectionist who's going to brag forever after that he threw Richardson about a hundred feet and didn't half try. The chap that asked me to do this stunt suggested that I do something in a light vein. Well, in as much as what I'm going to pull on you uh, uh, has to do with the projection of light, and uh, I'm vain enough to say that I composed it myself, I guess it's in a light vein, all right. Uh, I want uh, Larry Porter and Cook out there and Crozen to stop giggling at me. I, I, I'm giggling at myself, if you only knew it. And here I am up here and down there looking at myself. How can that be? Well, anyway, the, the projectionist sat in his room back behind and he watched all the screen figures wiggle. He wrinkled his nose and stroked his thin hair and then he said, said to himself with a giggle, he watched Norma Talmadge move gracefully around and said to himself with a grin, you're getting a bunch of the long green, my dear. Don't you think you would better wade in and do some real work? to earn all that dough, which with all my hard labor I've missed. Sure, you certainly should. Get a hump, Norma, dear. Move around, speed it up, get a twist. The projectionist moved a small lever a bit. Wasn't much, but it gave things a wallop. And Norma, poor dear, proceeded right then to go through the scene of the gallop. The projectionist winked his left eye at himself as he saw how like cute little monkeys, the great ones all moved as he made them to move, though he changed them from human to donkeys. 
Doug Fairbanks, quoth he, wouldn't even look at me. But for gosh, I'm his boss while he's here. He thinks he's some punkins, but he really is punk if I give him the wrong kind of steer. For I'm the boy who can make him step round or float long like breeze-driven feathers. I can paint out the sky with shadows so black that the fairest day looks like foul weather. I can make of the funeral procession a joke, and out of the joke make a race. With discolored light, I can paint up the nose of a preacher till he looks like a soap. I can make of the producer a very proud man by showing his goods the right way. Or it's easy for me to make it all look like what the cat dragged in today. The projectionist sat in his room back behind and watched all the screen figures wiggle. And as he thought of what he could do to all that, he treated himself to a giggle. Out of all of their art, I can make super art. Or I can make it a terrible show. Well, the program's done. Time to go home, so I lock up and go down below. And they were some of the first sound tests ever done with optical soundtracks on film. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. I hope that's convinced you that Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer was not the first talking picture by any means. But for the last 10 minutes you've been watching sound tests that were never intended for public usage and uh, we're talking about the products of this rather remarkable device, the radio valve. This particular one is uh, from the early 1930s. Um, the two top caps make it look like a, it has horns, uh, somewhat in the line of the devil. And uh, among radio people, these are known as mother-in-law tubes. <laughs> um, one of the top caps goes to the grid, the other one goes to the plate, and the cathode is taken out through the bottom. The Type 800 tube, which was produced, I think, about 1934, and according to the tag here, um, produces 35 watts of dissipation, operates to 60 megahertz RCA, the 800 tube. So we've been talking tonight about all of the products, or some of the products, I should say, of thermionic technology, amplifiers, and the triode, which dominated um, electronics from Dr. Lee DeForest's invention, 1906, until the advent of the pentode, about 1926, followed by all the other types of valves. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lemur. It's now 11.06 p.m. We're a little bit overdue for a callback on two metres. <clears throat> so now we'll go over to that. I hope I've got all the adjustments right. Hang on. Headphones on my sensitive ear. So, um, do we have any listeners out on 147.475? VK3 Alpha Mike Lemur, standing by for any calls. VK3 Alpha Charlie Zulu. VK3 Golf Lima Charlie. We have, oh, we have VK3 ACZ. I've just done something fearsome to my sign behind me. I'll just bring that up again. Sorry about this, folks. Uh, VK3 ACZ Peter. And VK3 GLC, I think, Gary. Um, so we'll take Peter first with a pause for any other calls. I heard another carrier there, but not modulated. VK3 ACZ uh, to take with the group. VK3 AML. VK3 Alpha AML. Peter, AML in the group. VK3 ACZ. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, Gary and uh, all other listeners, and uh, still wondering where Dave is, uh, ECG, hoping he'd be back already, but uh, perhaps not. Um, well, the uh, Commonwealth Games are finished anyway. He was over there in the prime uh, location. Uh, I don't know where to start. Uh, KHJ, what's some, some wonderful film footage. Oh, Chris, I absolutely love anything historic like that, and to see people, to think that you know we're looking at people... Uh, even still photographs excite me of uh, folk who are, are no longer uh, 
on this mortal coil. But uh, to see them in moving pictures and hear the sound and all that sort of stuff, just super. And test broadcasts are notwithstanding. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, I wasn't aware, and forgive me for being so ignorant about this, I wasn't aware of, uh, about vacuum tubes and the name. Uh, if it weren't for this week, uh, qrz.com have the daily quiz, which I do, and it ends up being something of a multiple guess because uh, I don't know what the FCC rules are about certain things. It's a very American-biased uh, uh, ten question multiple guess quiz every day that comes out but uh, one of the uh, questions was uh, uh, what do uh, English people call vacuum tubes and of course uh, I, I naturally assumed that everyone in the world called them valves, uh, that's what I've always known uh, them as but anyway it's just so funny that only this week uh, I was educated about that sort of stuff but the usual uh, absolutely fantastic broadcast I see you had quite a few um, uh, watches there when I, I I signed on. I was listening at first on two metres and then thought no, 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 I absolutely have to see the picture. I've got to watch the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes again, which I am able to do at my leisure, of course, uh, probably tomorrow, but uh, just so just so grateful to be here every Saturday night to uh, see what you've got to offer and missed you last week uh, no drama about that at all of course but uh, no you had other things uh, pressing and important too but uh, all good Chris uh, fantastic uh, to be on VK3 AML in the group VK3 ACZ and no broker in there VK3 ACZ and group VK3 AML um, well last week was stymied by the fact that the computer was away at the shop for three days having uh, a new hard disk put into the RAID 5 drive. One of the, dis the hard disks collapsed on us and uh, the sound card which had been operating on one of the stereo channels, the left channel I think for the better part of a year, with the right channel dead, started to have trouble in the left channel as well. So needless to say I had to just get the whole thing seen to took the computer, the main computer, the big computer, down to the shop and they fixed it all for me and went through the time-consuming job of rebuilding the RAID 5 drive. Um, yeah, uh, I was unsure as to whether to play some of the illustrations, uh, there being music on them. Of course, music is not illegal to play on the air in Australia. Entertainment is so uh, these were historical technical illustrations not really entertainment although i suppose nah, it's a gray area but um i hoped uh, nobody would object to the occasional musical illustration on the soundtrack to indicate the quality being achieved by the various workers in the early 1920s professor ticacina at the university of illinois was uh, using a, just a carbon microphone very poor audio quality, but he managed to get an optical recording before just about anybody else, with the exception of a worker originally in Europe, later in New York, Eugene Laust, L-A-U-S-T-E, who devised a method of modulating a, uh, a mirror galvanometer to produce a variable area track on film about the time of the First World War. Some of his very short clips have survived, but nothing has been committed to internet as yet. So the Ticacina um, optical sound films are the oldest ones currently accessible, 1921. But you can hear from the results on those tracks how fast the audio quality improved. By the time um, Dr Lee de Forest was doing his early tests November 1921, the quality was really rather acceptable. Anyway, around to Gary, VK3GLC and group with a pause for any breakers, VK3AML. Okay, thank you, Chris. Nothing heard in that gap from this location. Uh, however, that's not any major indication that uh, there wasn't anybody there, but uh, you've probably got a better listening position than I have. All well received at this location, uh, mainly via the interwebs. I did have a uh, minor hiccup um, in the latter stages where the uh, uh, video and audio got out of sync. Um, it's a bit of a, an issue with the uh, television that I'm using, but uh, a little bit of uh, judicious uh, paging back fixed the problem and uh, 
got it back in sync again. Not quite sure what happened. I didn't notice any uh, disturbance on the traffic graphs, but uh, oh well. This is uh, this is what happens. But uh, yeah, all well received. I thought I'd dash out here tonight and uh, um, push the button on the callback. Um, but I uh, generally around uh, watching uh, inside, uh, even if I don't get back on the call, the callback on the. Uh, on your test transmissions, but uh, all very goodly. Back to you, VK3 AML and the group VK3 GLC. VK3 BLX. And acknowledging VK3 BLX, whose name I've, it just escapes me at the moment. Was it Graham? I'm not quite sure. Um, VK3 BLX, VK3 AML and group. Uh, and I've just got a, a message on the text chat saying. Uh, any updates on shortwave Australia? Um, I did talk about eight days ago to Dave 3ASE, who's operating shortwave Australia from Newbera, just north of Bendigo, about 17 kilometres north of Bendigo, on a 60 acre property now. And uh, he tells me that he's operating two dipoles from two separate 100 watt transmitters both, as I understand it, operating from the same VFO. One dipole set is north-south orientation, the other is east-west orientation, and one of the dipoles is up about 80 feet, strung between trees, I gather. He's got quite a few gum trees, very tall gum trees on his property. Um, he's making the best of 4835. 2310, he hasn't put much effort into at this stage. I thought the 2310 was a little on the weak side, and when he told me what he was operating on 2310, I had hysterics. <laughs> he tells me that all he wanted to do with 2310 for the moment, until he gets a proper transmitter sorted out, <laughs> was to put a 5 watt signal generator on 2310 just to keep the frequency occupied. So no wonder the bloody thing's fairly weak. Um, there's about five watts going out. Um, however, I was speaking to a friend in Tasmania who has the old 3RPH, the Radio for the Print Handicapped transmitter that used to be, I think, on 1629 kilohertz or somewhere around there, top end of the broadcast band, and was operated out of the... Uh, Collingwood shack of 3CR as it used to be behind the Collingwood Town Hall. It's been decommissioned, the transmitter was taken to Tasmania, it's capable of running a kilowatt. Dave has a permit for five kilowatts but I don't think he'll ever get there because he can't afford the, the, the electricity bill. Although you never know, he might install a huge number of solar panels if he gets so inclined. But um, I gather there may be something afoot to get the old R3RPH transmitter onto 2310. That's all I know at the moment, that uh, it's early days, but Dave seems to be operating every day on 4835. It's well worth listening to. So I'll hand over to VK3BLX. Graham, what's news from your quarters? VK3, Bravo Lima X-Ray. Is it Graham? I'm not sure. VK3 AML. BK3AML and the group BK3BLX uh, handles John. Handles oh. John. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed it all tonight. Uh, the interviews from the old timers there, uh, those uh, uh, early pioneers, gee, they were ambitious, weren't they? I mean, they were just uh, so determined to uh, to just progress things. Uh, just amazing to watch. Uh, I don't, don't put it back to me um, on each round, uh, uh, Chris, because I'm working on something here. I'll, I'll just keep tinkering away and listening, but I just wanted to say, great show again. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, really, really good. VK3 AM on the group, VK3 BLX. Yeah, thanks for the compliment, John. Um, appreciate it. And I understand uh, quite often when I'm in the shack, uh, if I'm talking on the air, I'm doing something with a soldering iron or you know, uh, rewiring plugs or whatever. You wouldn't believe the, the number of interconnections that are required, or perhaps you would, when you're running one computer 
with live stream another computer on my right which a little bit later I'll be running with zoom uh, a mixer with four five channels occupied uh, an audio peak limiter running from the output of the mixer and the um, interface with the two transformers in it with level controls in it between um, the audio peak limiter and the transmitter it's everything has to be lined up with the right uh, audio levels and uh, things can get out of hand one of the things that threw me this week is that the new sound card that I got I, I would have assumed that in computers sound cards would be standardized in level no such luck everything was different input level for line input was different in output level from card output was different so I've had to as best I can um, I'll check the uh, stream of this by playback to see if there's any distortion um, but I think I've got it all set up properly with the oscilloscope over there oh and uh, while I'm talking about valves um, this presentation valve was a, a gift from my very good friend um, uh, Jeff Sylvester VK3 now I've done it <laughs> VK3 he'll come up and he'll tell me his call sign he'll, and he'll say you idiot VJS I have to remember his initials Jeff Sylvester VJS VK3 VJS Jeff Sylvester thank you for the thermonic product on my right anyway round to Peter 3ACZ and can you tell us anything about the next meeting of the Sherbrooke Club? It should be fairly soon, I think. VK3ACZ and group, VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML on the group, VK3ACZ, and good evening to you, John, as well. Um, well, I can tell you that uh, next Monday night is uh, our on-air meeting on RAJ, Be There or Be Square, and uh, it'll be the first, uh, first Monday of the month. Uh, looking forward to it and I don't know if we've got anything in particular planned yet well I'll find out on Monday night with the broadcast or oh, I'm just looking at uh, that tube you're holding up there because I'm about 60 seconds delay on my um, uh, on, on my visuals with you now uh, a couple of things come to mind uh, oh, first of all tonight's uh, uh, until four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the Alara contest. So anybody listening that wants to help the ladies out, uh, I think it's terrific that uh, they're involved in amateur radio and uh, running a contest and all that uh, are worthwhile. The DX has been absolutely fantastic today. G20 metres was firing in all cylinders, but uh, that's almost as an aside. I had some really good contacts uh, over in Europe on the long path. But uh, uh, I did want to say that uh, concerning the um, shortwave broadcast with Radio Australia and I won't say it the way he says it uh, I was surprised by your comments because 2310 is the one I've been hearing uh, most clearly uh, I'm, I'm really surprised and blown away by uh, <laughs> what uh, turns out to be the practical reality so there you go, good thing my radio wasn't told that uh, or it might perform I noticed too somebody's been playing music on 1865 I haven't been um, able to hang around long enough to uh, find out who it is, uh, you might know Chris. Anyway, back to you, VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ. VK3ACZ and group VK3AML, well, um, there are a number of people that run test transmissions on 1865, it being such an underutilised band in Australia, I'm surprised anybody's listening to it. Um, there are a few stations that do that sort of thing. One in particular I know runs NBFM on 160, uh, mostly because if he uses envelope modulation it gets into his neighbour's uh, audio systems. It's always the problem with AM, um, at least with sideband, if it, the envelope modulation is demodulated by an audio system, you can't understand who it is, you can't understand what they're saying and uh, if you're a neighbour of the person your <laughs> identity is hidden but if you're transmitting AM they can hear every word in hi-fi um, by rectification usually from computer speakers they're lousy with it um, 
because most computer speakers have the amplifier in the speaker and the speaker itself is plastic or wooden construction, no RF shielding at all. So if you're in a high RF environment, computer speakers make an excellent receiver, untuned receiver. Um, so I'll be interested in the Monday 3R RAJ meeting. Um, I presume it'll be about 7.30 or thereabouts, not sure. Could be earlier. Uh, but uh, I hope to be at the next meeting of the Sherbrooke Radio Club. Just as a matter of interest, fellas, um, Tuesday lunchtime, uh, I've been a part of a group of four people originally going to Auburn South Primary School in the early 60s, and as a result of our sixth grade teacher, who was particularly enlightened, we were given a, a creative introduction to the last year of primary school by a teacher who handed us the science demonstration teaching pamphlet and he said I'm not going to teach this you four boys and one girl have to teach this so uh, we got together and we did things like um, boiling water in a kerosene tin putting the cap on and then the air pressure crushes the tin as the steam condenses, we also built out of Meccano a mechanical gramophone that we could record by scratching into wax um, our voices by yelling at a diaphragm. Um, we were all 11 or 12 when we were doing this. We measured the speed of sound by getting the school's bass drum down the other end of the school ground and a pair of binoculars timing the arrival of the sound with a stopwatch. That took great reflexes. But the result of all of that was that we were in such a creative environment that the sixth grade class from 1965 has kept in contact all these years. And uh, out of a class of 32, there were big classes in the 60s, it being the baby boom, um, the, end, the tail end of the baby boom. Out of our class of 32, two have died in the last 57 years. That's pretty good going. Could be a lot worse and uh, something like 17 of us are still in touch and we're having a, a, a lunch at a local pub near the old primary school on Tuesday so we're all getting on a bit we're pushing 70 now most of the people but it's a delight to uh, shake the hand of sit down and natter with the people who were the the wallpaper of one's childhood, I suppose, would be the best description. Um, one particular bloke there who went far within the police force, a um, good friend of mine, and I spent most of the mid-60s climbing trees, not for exercise. We were putting wires up the trees to do things with shortwave radio, initially receiving, and the other thing I won't admit to, <laughs> VK... <laughs> I better quit while I'm ahead. VK3 GLC and the group VK3 AML. Yeah, fair enough, Chris. Well, I think uh, a fair proportion of us may uh, may have to admit to being uh, in a similar sort of boat, but uh, uh, all I can say is those were the days. Um, things have changed somewhat, but however... Um, it was all good, clean fun until somebody got poked in the eye with a sharp stick. Uh, fortunately, I missed that uh, that ailment. I one or two uh, fellow uh, students uh, had some nasty accidents, but never mind. We won't uh, won't go into that. Sort of uh, it reminds me of I think it was uh, was it last week. Uh, no, it wasn't the last week. Week before last, uh, yeah, the, uh, your live stream there. You had a diagram of um, uh, inter-exchange coaxial cable, all the various uh, tubes and uh, interstice pairs, which sort of uh, reminded me of tonight of uh, yeah, valves, vacuum tubes. Uh, there was uh, still some of that stuff around... Uh, at the start of my uh, career in telecommunications, uh, still
still alive and well and kicking and working quite nicely, at least between Adelaide and Gawler. Um, and various functions for uh, interstice pairs and uh, various broadcast lines going back on I said there was either 10 or a, uh, 20 megahertz Siemens system adorned with uh, C3G valves so they were very pop popular at the time in a uh, black metal shield and uh, amount of time spent routining and aligning and uh, frequency sweeping and, and the like um, certainly something to keep one uh, one busy from uh, from week to week. Oh, and batteries, yes, battery routines, got to love those. And speaking of which, well, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Dave can power his, uh, uh, his little setup there on D cells. I think there's a, uh, I think there's some instructions going around somewhere on uh, how many D cells one needs to uh, produce a decent signal. Uh, I could be mistaken. Hmm. VK3 AML Group, VK3 GLC. We had an unmodulated carrier there, not all that strong. Uh, would you care to go again? Do you, um, are, are you trying to break in? VK3 AML for the QRZ station. No, just a carrier. Um, hmm. Hello to whoever it was, anyway. Um, I'm just wondering what a battery routine is. I'm, I'm sure you're not talking about a tap dance with a lead acid cell in each hand, but could I hand it back to you, <laughs> Gary, for what the hell is a battery routine? Ah, uh, yes, one of those very important things that was done on 48 volt systems uh, at least every month. Um, before the advent of uh, supposed uh, maintenance-free seal, sealed cells, it was the um, the act of going around and recording the uh, cell voltage of each individual two-volt cell, recording the specific gravity uh, of each particular cell, um, checking the uh, connections between the cells, making sure that the tension on the bolts was correct. Uh, and once all of that had been done, um, having one, uh, more than one uh, battery bank, you would then go through a, uh, a discharge and uh, recharge routine. Um, could basically waste half a day doing that or more. So, uh, yeah, no, it was nothing to do with uh, dancing around with uh, two volt cells in your hands. Go ahead. And we had another blank carrier there. Would you care to say something, that station? Nope. He's a lot quieter than... He's a lot weaker than yourself, Gary, so don't worry. Um, hmm. OK, 48 volt systems. I wonder if the advent of uh, lithium is going to eventually see the end of lead acid or whether lead acid still has the major economic benefit... It's interesting when a new technology like lithium comes along, how fast things can change. Certainly, let's, you know, like with electric lighting in this house, it'd be hard to find a non LED light source now. And that's all happened in the last 15 years. Um, yeah, yeah. C3G Siemens valve, I presume that they, they, that was heritage equipment back from an earlier. Um, an earlier period and I presume you're talking about telephone repeaters of some kind not unlike that uh, film narrated by Lowell Thomas incidentally Lowell Thomas uh, very first film I ever remember going to see because it was so spectacular was a Lowell Thomas production non-fiction my mum I must have been three which would have made it 1957 took me into the Plaza Theatre in Collins Street. The Plaza Theatre was the downstairs theatre from the Regent. And in that theatre they had arranged a semicircular screen, full 180 degrees around the audience, with three synchronised projectors pointing left, right and centre. 
merging the images at the joins so that there were three full projectors projecting a 180 degree image it was called Cinerama and my mother took me to the program which had a film called Seven Wonders of the World uh, which had some of the most spectacular cinematography I think I've ever seen uh, swooping views taken from a plane flying over the Iguazu Falls in South America um, and particularly I remember a sequence taken from the front of a runaway tea train in India. I suspect they felt they, they undercranked the cameras to produce the high speed of the, the train but to see this from an audience position in the middle of a semicircular projected picture which occupied your whole field of view was really spectacular and the producer and the narrator was a very much older Lowell Thomas than the one you saw in that film so he had um, an impact on my very first experience of cinema documentary cinema and only recently has that film Seven Wonders of the World the documentary the travel documentary been reassembled into a version on Blu-ray. It's quite spectacular if you can ever see it. Uh, so back to Peter VK3ACZ, and you say that the uh, uh, HF is is bubbling. I, I've been hearing that there are major sunspots that have come around the last week or so, so things should be looking up on the present cycle. Any particular DX you can quote, Peter? VK3ACZ and group VK3AML. And we say morning. Oh, John, VK3GG. Acknowledge you. I'll bring you in after Gary. Yeah, VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ. And good evening to you, John. Um, well, f first of all, uh, a question for you, Chris. <laughs> the cameo in Belgrave, I can't remember exactly when, but they're showing it. They have wonderful features uh, going back to the old uh, silent films and the very, very earliest talkies and all that sort of stuff, which you're probably quite aware of. Um, oh, to answer your question about DX, though, well, um, uh, funny thing, uh, last week, this time last week, things were a bit subdued. We had a CME on Friday. Uh, and we had some G2 level solar activity. The solar wind was way up there and uh, I don't think it, uh, it uh, detracted from things too severely. It must have been bad when the uh, CME happened, but I think it was in the early hours of our Friday morning. So we missed the best of it. We just knew that the K index was up to six or seven or whatever. I, I still managed some good contacts uh, even on the daytime side of it. But uh, things have been a lot better. Uh, K index is one, the sun's r relatively quiet. I noticed that the solar flux is only starting to go up again. It, it went down to 97 or something uh, last week. I said uh, last time I looked, I think it was 119 or something. We really wanted above 150 before the bands like 10 and 15 start going gangbusters. But uh, 20, which still performs even at sunspot minimum, was really, really uh, super tonight. Uh, big caudal hops. Uh, I was talking to uh, stations and long path to Europe that uh, didn't want to believe that I was giving them 30 over 9, that I must have had two preamps in or something like that. And, uh, and I was getting 9s from them back, so uh, some super conditions. Uh, I suppose my favourites, and yes, we do a bit of the... Uh, Michael CMC calls them machine gunning. You know, those stations that just want a signal report and bef before you finished uh, uh, saying anything to them, they're, they're, it's almost like a contest. You know, they're moving on to the next station. Well, I, I've had one or two of those, but today was remarkable because I found, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the French station uh, in Normandy and the other one... Um, halfway between Stuttgart and Munich uh, were on for a long chat and uh, it was just so uh, you know, truth is I like a little bit of both I like knowing where my signal's getting out so uh, a quick you know, uh, signal report and, and get lost is not always such a bad thing but uh, it was very very um, uh, encouraging and, and an awful lot of fun today at Portable at the location that you and I went up there uh, I'm so glad you weren't there to see me putting the uh, antenna up in the air, though. I, I think I had about 40 throws with the um, the nylon cord and the sinker to actually hit the limb that I wanted. Uh, very, very embarrassing. 
but uh, also had the 80 meter end fed up there so that I could work some um, some of the Alara lasses this afternoon and uh, I managed uh, some good contacts you know 10 over 9 because I would ask the girls for genuine signal reports and I was getting uh, 10 over 9 from Adelaide on 5 watts which again is very satisfying uh, I could have tried QRP to uh, uh, to uh, Europe. I've done it before, but I did hear a VK6 uh, working C- 6 watts um, uh, get into Germany, and uh, I heard both sides of the conversation there. So, yeah, band's in good condition. Sorry, I'm probably boring you with all that waffle. Um, back to you, uh, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. No, not at all, Peter. Um, VK3 ACZ in group, VK3 AML. Um, I was actually doing a little bit of DX this morning. Um, I had uh, insomnia and got up just to have a cup of tea at 3.30 a.m., a time I'm never normally up at. And I dialed up 80 metres on one of the South Australian... Uh, web SDRs. I think it was the one run by VK5 ARG, which is in a particularly quiet location called Tarley, north of Adelaide, which Gary is familiar with, being a South Australian, um, or a former South Australian, Gary. Um, And uh, I noticed that on about 3.75, a little bit outside our band, maybe 3.8, there were some sideband signals, so I tuned in and um, they were ZSs. Um, I had to look it up. South Africa. South Africa. With a strong Africana accent. And um, quite strong on 80 metres, around about strength 7 to 8. And the interesting thing is that with South Africa here, it's a little bit difficult because I think the signal goes over the poles. Uh, if you do the uh, uh, Great Circle route. Certainly it goes over the poles from New Zealand. New Zealanders tell me that South Africa is one of the hardest countries for them to hit. But that's the first time in a very long time I've heard South Africa. And, of course, for their evening, you really have to get up wee wee hours of the morning for uh, to listen from here. But quite strong, South Africa on 80 metres. I've never heard them before. Never heard that ZS before. Um, so it's over to Gary and then to John 3GG. Um, the Siemens C- C3G valve, was that some super long life thing that Siemens had devised for um, telephone repeaters or something? VK3GLC and group VK3AML. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um yeah, they're fairly reliable sort of valves, they're a very small thing. Okay, if I, I've got an example of one around here, I'll, uh, when I find it I'll uh, send you a picture of it. Um, but it was a fairly common unit, um, especially in the Siemens uh, carrier gear. Um, not so much in the, uh, in the radio gear, but uh, the standard... Uh, sort of uh, carrier gear for hanging on the end of coax cables was, uh, was the flavour of uh, the flavour of the day uh, still uh, still in use uh, up until about uh, I think it was probably 1987 something like that when the uh, the first uh, PCM digital systems were uh, released to the masses uh, and uh, things were slightly cut over from the analog um, FDM system over to uh, PCM digital. Uh, eventually, the uh, whole line system was decommissioned, but um, uh, because uh, Gawler was sort of a uh, a drop and insert station, uh, we had some line, uh, some terminal gear there as well. So there was. Uh, couple of tubes coming off of the coax into the uh, local line system uh, where you had the uh, frequency domain architecture. Uh, I think we only had one one supergroup, 
which is a uh, specific form of hierarchy. A group is a specific number of channels and then uh, that's multiplied up into super groups, super master groups, etc, etc. And uh, then pumped into the uh, coax line gear at uh, 10 or 20 megahertz, so I got a sneaking suspicion my ours was either 20 or 25, something like that. But uh, yeah, it's one of the particular valves that uh, was uh, around at the time. Um, I did note that there was uh, some old uh, J systems kicking around down the back of the line transmission room. Uh, they'd been long decommissioned, um, just waiting to be pulled out. Uh, they were um, heavily valve orientated, uh, for, used to drive the um, open wire line systems to the various uh, regional country exchanges. Um, I think I've still got some documentation kicking around here for those, but uh, uh, they were sort of fairly labour intensive too, um, swapping valves out and doing line ups and uh, balance tests and, uh, and you name it. So it sort of, um, yeah, sort of sparked my memory of that sort of stuff. And uh, Itali, uh, yeah, interesting little place. Uh, I used to live on the uh, uh, eastern edge of the town. Uh, my acre of property was uh, right next to 75 acres of uh, farmland, which was uh, pretty good. And the uh, yeah, five uh, ARG receiver, uh, sits up on top of the hill at Taylor's Gap. Um, I had a look at their photographs and uh, from the photographs on their website I worked out where exactly it was. Uh, it's up where the, um, the CMTS and uh, the, um, the government mobile radio system sits right up on the top of the hill. So I know where they've got their receiver up there. So I guess they've got some uh, uh, arrangement with one of the uh, services that's running up there. Not sure which one, but uh, I'll uh, find out soon enough. So that yes, um, very very uh, effective receiver. Uh, I would agree. Uh, VK3 AML Group VK3 GLC. Yeah, VK3 GLC and Group VK3 AML. Um, Interesting you had so much uh, carrier gear going on the coax cable up there. I wonder where the coax cable would terminate. Udna data? Would it run all the way to Alice Springs through there? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I would imagine that Tali would be kind of on the main line heading up towards... Uh, what's it called now? Port Perry, I think, up past there. Uh, haven't spent much time in South Australia. Actually, it's probably the the state where I've spent the least time, unfortunately, so I don't know it very well. Um, and I've mostly spent time in the southern part of the state, Mount Gambier, Lake Alexandrina, um, and the mouth of Murray, where a friend of ours has a house. My wife's family actually partly comes from Port um, Victor Harbour, I should say and uh, quite a few relatives are uh, buried at Murray Bridge, my wife's relatives. So with that, um, we'll run it over to John, vk 3 G. if you're still there, John. Um, how have you been keeping? Oh, and the Cameo Cinema in Belgrave, yes, it's independently owned, which allows them a little bit more leeway than Hoyts or Greater Union in what they show. Uh, vk 3 E G to take, vk 3 AML. Yeah, 3 AML, VK3 Double G. Yeah, the same guy owns the Glen Cinema in Glen Ferry, and he owns the uh, the one in uh, Ripon Lee. Uh, uh, I know what it's called, it's can't think at the moment. But yes, uh, uh, he's the son of a guy who owned a service station chain, so he had enough money to buy these cinemas and run them. But yes, I'm quite surprised at what I just heard before about uh, Dave's 21 3 only being 5 watts from the signal generator, because more often than not, 4835 doesn't come through here in Upway, mm. but uh, um, 2310 comes through all the time, Lily. Really. So uh, I thought he'd be running a lot more than 5 watts. But anyway, yeah, all quite entertaining there. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that comment in, but anyway. 
No worries, John. Are you keeping well up there at the moment? Oh, trying to. It's freezing. Oh, yeah. You, you're up. You're up ne nearly what? Five hundred meters. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's a it's a very good DX location for VHF. Although I I um, like Peter, I I don't notice a great deal of difference on HF with altitude. I mean, even um, when you get to sky waves, it, it doesn't seem to matter a huge amount how high the antenna is, even a dipole. Um, if you get it down lower, it shoots better up vertically and means that your short skip is better. If you put it up higher, the long skip is better. It depends on what you want it for, I guess. Um, yeah, so background to Peter. Um, VK3ACZ. If any of you have any suggestions for a topic that I could take on in the Saturday night sessions, please let me know. One suggestion I had earlier tonight from VK3TET was to do a, uh, with permission of whoever the manufacturers are, to uh, run some videos of current manufacturers of valves, although I think most of them are either in uh, China or Russia and I don't know what the sort of chances of getting video clips out of Russia are at the moment with what's going on in Ukraine um, but uh, I think Sovtech is one of the valve manufacturers in Russia and uh, it would certainly be interesting to see if they're using any significantly upgraded techniques to manufacture valves compared with the days 60 or 70 years ago when they were at their peak. VK3ACZ and group VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML in the group, VK3ACZ. And uh, just wondering if John got any snow. Uh, it was for This week it was forecast to be below 500. Mm. Um, it certainly, uh, they must have had some at Mount Tannenong, but anyway. Um, oh, I, I might be uh, making an early exit. I've just noticed that uh, when I was wheeling my trolley back down the hill, Chris, I, uh, I had took a bit of a tumble. And I'm just back here, and good thing I did a little inventory. I noticed that uh, one of my uh, fishing reels that I have an NFED antenna on is not uh, where it's supposed to be, so I probably left it up there in the dark when I took the little tumble. So I'll be driving back up the heights again myself uh, very, very soon. At least it's in a place that nobody's going to be walking around in the dark and uh, trip over it, but more fool me for not realising I didn't put it in the car. Uh, them's the brakes. Uh, and I'm, but I'm also uh, getting back on subject a little bit. I'm glad I'm not the only one who expresses a little bit of surprise that 2310 uh, is propagating so well. Uh, as I said, it beats the, uh, the 4 meg frequency uh, for broadcast, or at least it was the last time I was listening um, earlier in the week, I think it was. But uh, don't listen every day. Probably should, probably should show a bit of support, but uh, still pretty good what he's doing, if I can get used to uh, his station call sign, hi, hi. Uh, back to you, Chris, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACC. Oh, and uh, any word from uh, Dave ECG? Over. I've heard absolutely nothing from Dave, um, rather ominously, actually. And I might cut it short this week without doing Zoom. I'm feeling pretty pooped. As I said, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning and didn't really get a full night's sleep last night. Um, so I might take it just round for one more over. If Rolly's watching in Auckland, sorry, Rolly, I would have liked to have brought you in via Zoom, but I think we'll forego it this week. I do want to try Jitsi too, the open source version of um, uh, video conferencing. Um, and see what the opportunity is to use that for more than 40 minutes, in which case we might do one of these weeks with exclusively video call-in rather than on this frequency. Um, so VK3GLC in the group, I suppose take it one more round and then call it quits. VK3GLC in the group, VK3AML. Yeah, awesome, Chris. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for presenting the content again uh, tonight. As I say, all well received as it usually is, and uh, uh, a lot of interesting stuff in there. Some of it I have actually seen uh, before, and just trawling the internet, um, 
stuff comes up randomly, but there's a lot of stuff that I haven't seen and uh, sort of uh, expertly tweaked by uh, your systems to make it a lot better than pro what it probably would have been uh, had I seen it without that. So uh, greatly appreciated. Certainly gives a little bit of uh, Saturday Saturday night uh, looking. Um, of course, we can't call it entertainment, but it's uh, it's certainly uh, certainly looking stuff for sure. So uh, yeah, I'll bid you all a, a good evening, and uh, um, we we'll hope to catch you next week and uh, see what the content is going to be then. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for letting us in there, and. Uh, uh, very, bid you all a very good evening, VK3, uh, Gold Flamer Charlie. Yeah, thanks Gary, we'll catch you down the week, no problem. I'll just see if John VK3BLX is still with us. VK3 Bravo Lima X-Ray, are you tied up with soldering or have you tootled off or are you still around? VK3 BLX and group, VK3 AML. BK3 AML on the group, BK3 BLX. No, Chris still here, still uh, soldering iron in hand and cutters and <laughs> the usual thing. So uh, just reading the mail, as we used to say. Um, so, uh, yeah, very entertaining and very informative as usual. I particularly like to see some of that stuff about the early recording on uh, film, sound soundtrack, uh, optical soundtrack on the film. It was really very interesting. I hadn't seen any of that really early stuff, and as you commented, it was pretty amazing how rapidly the uh, quality improved. That was quite dramatic. Uh, fascinating stuff. All right, thanks again, and uh, we'll hopefully catch you next week. VK3 AML in the group. Uh, good evening to everybody else. Uh, VK3 BLX is clear. OK, it's over to John, I guess, to tie the ribbons. Uh, John, VK3 EWG, VK3 AML. <laughs> Causing trouble there, something jamming on the frequency. You can probably hear Dave in the background because actually I've got Dave coming through at the moment. But uh, yes, uh, it's quite amazing that he's getting out so well on um, five watts, as we were saying before. But uh, yes, all very. Um, but uh, I was going to comment on something else. I've totally forgotten what it was now. I was about to say it when somebody started blotting on another frequency that's there. So. Uh, uh, I'll say morning and uh, we'll put it by for the time being. OK, thanks, John. Um, and thanks for popping up. So this is uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Um, I'll take a final call and listen for any other breakers before closing. Just a quick uh, over three ACs head. Yeah, go, uh, go for it, Pete. Yeah, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. I meant to comment before, that was a good uh, capture you got there hearing the ZS's uh, on 80 metres. Definitely not heard them on 80, but then uh, uh, I'm not around that time of day normally. I've worked them on uh, 10, 15 and 20 in the last few months, but uh, would love to get a contact on 80. Uh, have to work on it. This afternoon on 20, we had a Namibia station uh, beaming on the long path, uh, Victor 51, Mike Alpha, he wasn't as strong as he normally is, so I didn't give him a shout. But uh, uh, again, yeah, just wanted to say uh, what a fantastic uh, contact that is. Being an old uh, shortwave listener, I uh, I can still get my jollies over hearing. I don't have to actually transmit to them to be uh, impressed, and that was a good one. Anyway, thank you for your broadcast tonight, Chris. It's been a beauty. I think you put the uh, the people that complain about it having a no not enough radio contact in will be uh, will have to wash their mouths out with soap or, or be definitely reproved. Uh, it was certainly pitched towards amateur radio. Not that I have a problem with whatever you broadcast. Uh, uh, you haven't brought up anything that hasn't been interesting and or fascinating with me. But anyway, thank you again for what you do and uh, hope to hear you on Monday night on RHA at 19.30. Otherwise, on the 5th um, at uh, the Sherbrooke Radio Club uh, club rooms. Uh, good night, Chris, and thank you. VK3 AML and good night, everybody else. VK3 ACZ. Good morning. The other thing I was going to talk about was, uh, yes, I wonder how uh, UR4LL stuff for sale is going, because he's in Ukraine. He was uh, probably the, the last place you could go to at where you could get all sorts of stuff for making high power missiles and whatever at a reasonable price. Uh, uh, I bought a few things from him. 
but uh, I haven't in the last year or so because I haven't had any money to do any projects. But anyway, uh, um, it'll be interesting to find out what, what, what's happened because he can get all sorts of high power valves and roller inductors and big tuning capacitors and you name it, stuff for making big business, he, he had it. So, uh, uh, and like I said, at quite reasonable prices. Um, yeah, anyway, with that comment, we'll, we'll say morning. No worries, John. Anyway, uh, final call. Uh, anybody else want to make a comment before we go? VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, listening. Yeah, well, Mr Branch wouldn't have worried about things being either music or entertainment, but anyway. Well, I, I, I try to keep it, if there is music there, it's, it's for a technical reason that I'm showing it. Either it's historical or uh, it's an example of audio, uh, a soundtrack recording quality, which those recordings were. And that one of the child performer, Ruth Dietzmann, was recorded in 1923, filmed in 1923, so it's almost 100 years old. Frightening. And uh, it's interesting also that that D Danish early sound film was an early product of Autophon, long before they got into uh, moving coil cartridges, which is their main line now. Anyway, with that, I'll say a very good night to everybody. Um, I am cutting it short. It's just on midnight. Normally we go to half past, but uh, I've been uh, burning the candle at both ends, so feeling a little bit lacking in ability to produce words <laughs> all the best until next week vk3 alpha mike lima now closing listening yeah, well, yes, i heard all those bits about mr autophon and uh, things like that it was most interesting um i hadn't heard that bit about autophon but uh yes i uh, i also think if the wia and all the rest stand up for keeping the old old amateur radio with morse code well the old old amateur radio also included music broadcasting and uh, quite a lot of developments for broadcasting were pioneered by amateurs so we should be to not be hypocritical if we're going to say we want Rudy X and Morse code we should also be saying we want music but anyway we've actually got it if you look at the regulations the regulations with the new radio comms act 1995 and, and appendices or amendments um, now says that entertainment is illegal they could define that in any number of ways if you step out of line or if people complain they can certainly do something but in general I try to keep it to a, a, a factual informational sort of content um, so not really under the lines of entertainment more, more like uh, uh, under the heading of how things were done and how uh, technology developed uh, I do try to avoid music in these live streams and on the air not because it crosses the amateur radio regulations but because a lot of music is scanned for by bots on internet and YouTube and you can find yourself up with a uh, you can find yourself with a copyright challenge if you're not careful so I try to keep it to spoken word as you might have noticed from for example the Eddie Cantor clip from 1923 I kept to his patter and faded down as soon as the music stopped uh, started George Olson and his music playing background for Eddie Cantor who also was in the Ziegfeld Follies of 1922 um, OK, with that, I'll close and just listen before switching off. You yeah, right, we say morning. There was something else I was about to say that I've forgotten, but anyway, that's where crossband would be better. But anyway, we say morning. All the best, folks. I'll now um, go across to the live stream and have, have a look at the text and see if I can answer questions there. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima now closing on 147 475. Next week, either Jitsi or Zoom, I guarantee. So if anybody's watching from interstate and wants to come in on Zoom, sorry, I'm really too buggered to do it at the moment. VK3 AML clear on the, ra on the air. And uh, for the people on stream, um, Van Dan Escobar, lovely to see you. And uh, Dennis O'Day, 
nice to see you there. Uh, you asked about local uh, developments in sound film. Um, the DeForest Phono Film Company had multiple operators going to various parts of the world and for a short time in 1927, in April, May 1927, DeForest Phono Films operated an Australian studio uh, at the Rushcutters Bay Tram Sheds in Sydney and uh, they produced a silent feature film silent unfortunately called the romance of runny bead with the facilities there uh, based on a steel rudd story but they also brought out uh, they had a, a expert cameraman from deforest in new york harry jones who brought out a deforest phono film camera and with that they shot uh, variable density sound at the arrival of the duke and duchess of york at the landing stage at Farm Cove in Sydney during the Royal Visit 1927. That's, I think, now the oldest surviving Australian sound film. Um, so that's another DeForest product, but it's never been put onto internet. It is at the National Film and Sound Archive. You'll find it in their, um, in their uh, catalogue, and I believe there's playing on it musical material from the HMS Renown band. That's the British ship that brought out the Royal Couple. The Royal Couple were in Australia, incidentally, for the first opening of Federal Parliament in Canberra, May 1927. So that was filmed, I think, just before. Uh, then Ray Allsop, who was a radio pioneer also in Sydney, uh, did some experimental sound on disc films um, November 1928 through to about January 1929 before starting up his own projector, sound projector company called Rakerphone in Booth Street, Annandale. And later still, uh, a company called Standard Tone, Standard Tone, provided the background optical sound recording for a few films, um, the McDonough sisters' film The Cheetahs was originally silent, re-recorded with De variable density optical by Standard Tone, and another film called Showgirl's Luck, originally titled Talky Mad, produced in Sydney, was shot with variable density sound by Standard Tone. But there were a number of local producers of variable density optical recording um, the principal one in Sydney was Cine Sound, produced 17 feature films through the 1930s, all directed by Ken G. Hall, I think, with one exception. And uh, their studio was in Bondi Junction at a uh, uh, later Norman Ross discount store. I have actually been in that studio when it was a discount store. So, without too much further ado, um, Steve Haynes. Oh, we've got the local radio inspector who's <laughs> on the text chat. I hope I haven't stepped over the boundaries of the Radio Comms Act, Steve. I try to keep within the limits, try to keep it to instructional material. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, the material that is a bit more in a grey area, I tend to put at the end of the program towards 11 o'clock when most of the Mother Grundies who might complain would be in bed. Anyway, with that, uh, a very good night to everybody on the stream and uh, we'll see you next Saturday night, 9.30pm, for another session yet to be arranged. All the best, folks. And thank you for the people on the text chat.